Hi, I'm Jenny Champeau, the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and I'm here today with Michael Austin. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Jenny. Michael is uh, the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Snow College. He's the co-founder of By Common Consent Press and the author of nine books. His mm -hmm. most recent book is called The Testimony of Two Nations, How the Book of Mormon Reads and Rereads the Bible. And that was published by University of Illinois Press um, just this past year. Today we're looking at Mosiah 7 through 10. And the painting we're looking at is by James Fulmer. It's called The Hill North of Shilom. It was done in 2011. Um, Fulmer is a full-time seminary teacher and has done a lot of uh, paintings and illustrations to sort of fill in the gaps of art that, um, or scenes in the Book of Mormon that aren't visualized as frequently. Um, so Michael, the hill north of Shilom is not a place I hear talked about a lot in Sunday school. What, what is this place? Who are these people? Why is it important? So the hill north of Shilom we read about in Mosiah 7, I think for the first time. Okay. But it is, it's a hill overlooking the land of Nephi, which is the land where, uh, where the Nephites came from when they went to Zarahemla. This scene here doesn't really represent the scene in Messiah when mm -hmm. Ammon's party comes and meets Limhi and the people of, of the colony of right. Nephi, or the, the land of Nephi. Uh, what we see here are whole families, men, women, and children, standing on this hill looking at something being destroyed by fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, this passage is most representative of a passage in Omni, chapter 12, or, or chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Uh -huh. And this is when uh, the original, the first King Messiah, is warned mm -hmm. by a divine instrument that he needs to get all of the people who will leave and uh, leave the land of Nephi and go and find a promised land somewhere. Right. And that's the group that uh, goes and finds Zarahemla. Mm -hmm. And then his son, um, Messiah, well, Messiah becomes the king, and then uh -huh. his son Benjamin, and then Benjamin's son Messiah II, mm. become uh, in sequence the, the kings of Zarahemla. Um, but that all happens off stage. That all okay. happens in a part of the Book of Mormon uh, that uh, may or may not have been part of the 116 pages. But uh, we, we leave, really, we leave Enos there in the wilderness. Mm. We have these flyover chapters where we just get a little bit of detail and then all of a sudden it's 300 years later uh -huh. and we open up in Zarahemla and then we fill in the backstory. Mm -hmm. So this is part of the backstory and this painting okay. represents I think the artist's conception mm -hmm. of the people who left the land of Nephi mm -hmm. and how, how disturbed and how distraught they were mm. uh, that they had to leave their city and their city was burned and they don't know where they're going. They haven't found Zarahemla yet, and it's a very sad picture. Okay. So that scene um, where the original King Messiah is warned that he needs to leave, mm -hmm. uh, leave the land of Nephi, is uh, what a Bible scholars and what I call in, in this most recent book a type uh -huh. scene. Right, a type <clears throat> scene. And and it's something that's happened at least three times before. Okay. Where uh, somebody is warned by mm -hmm. an angel or by God or by a divine instrument mm -hmm. that the city they live in is about to be destroyed and they need to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the exodus in the Bible sure. with Moses. That is the beginning of the Book of Mormon in Jerusalem with Lehi and his family. Mm -hmm. That happens in 2 Nephi 5. That's how the Nephites got to the land of Nephi is mm. they were warned, Nephi was warned that he needed to leave and they kind of snuck out in the uh, middle of the night mm -hmm. and came to this land. Uh, so so this is something that keeps happening. As a bonus, it also happens in the Aeneid by Virgil, okay. <laughs> where Aeneas is warned by his mother, Venus, mm. that Troy is about to be right, sacked and right. he has to leave. Yeah. So this is a really famous yeah. type scene. Sure. Yeah. And the way that type scenes work, we can, we can kind of import elements from the earlier stories into the, more, the briefer version of the mm -hmm. story that we see here. And one of the things that all of those stories have in common is that some people are really glad to go mm -hmm. and some people murmur. Some people build calves of gold yeah. and worship them. Some people, like Laman and Lemuel, murmur all the time and mm -hmm. want to go back to Jerusalem. Yeah. So you have always in these type scenes a group mm -hmm. of people 
that leave and they want to go back. Hmm. So we find out at the end of Omni that as soon as uh, the, the Nephite um, population gets to Zarahemla, mm-hmm. a group of them want to go back. Uh-huh. And that group is, uh, they're, they're murmurers and they kill each other. Oh, right. Right? Yeah. The first group, they, they uh, all but 50 of them perish in the wilderness because right. they were very contentious. Uh-huh. So a second group then goes back and is lost for 60 years, mm-hmm. for three generations, and mm-hmm. nobody hears from them. But the first thing that Limhi says mm-hmm. when he sees Ammon is, uh, I'm going to quote here, it's, it's Mosiah 7, 14. And now it came to pass that after Limhi had heard the words of Ammon, he was exceedingly glad and said, Now I know of a surety that my brethren who were in the land of Zarahemla are yet alive. Mm. This is a really strange thing to say right. when you see this group of people from this land where you left all of your family members, oh my gosh, my family's still alive. They weren't all killed. Yeah. So that seems to be what he was expecting. He didn't know how that mm. Mulekite merger with the Nephites was going to play out. Right. And and all of these people had been, it seems, expecting that the Nephites were destroyed by the people of Zarahemla. So when Ammon, hmm. who is a descendant of Zarahemla, comes mm-hmm. leading a party looking for them, all of a sudden they, they have to reorient and, and they see that they, um, the, the situation they're in is not the situation they thought they were in. Right. Not right. only did the Nephites not all get killed, they're the kings now. Right. They're the ruling yeah. class. Right. So there's every reason for them to want to go back now. Okay, so, I mean, it's so hard for me to keep all this straight in my head because we have all these, like you said, gaps of time and then these different figures and fathers and sons and grandsons and it jumps forwards and backwards and place to place. Um, And and also the, just the role of the narrator in all this. Can you speak to that a little bit about how all this plays out? Yeah, this is by far the most narratively complex passage of the Book of Mormon. Uh, The, the, Scene that takes place in the land of Nephi. Mm-hmm. It's also, I think, the most important passage in the Book of Mormon, and we'll mm-hmm. talk about why in a minute. Okay. But you have uh, you have Mormon sort of editing and redacting the records mm-hmm. of Ammon, who discovers the record of Zenith, <laughs> and so you have these three different levels of narrative. Right. Three, what we call in narrative theory, three different levels of intentionality, hmm. okay. where where you have a story within a story within a story. Right. And that's really hard to keep track of. It is. And then when you have Alma kind of break away, you have a fourth narrative that is within a narrative, within a narrative, within a narrative, within a narrative. Yeah. So so it, it's very complex. Uh, but the most important thing that happens in the Book of Mormon, uh, other than Christ coming in third mm-hmm. Nephi, is that Alma, after listening to Abinadi, starts a church. Right, he and this is yes. the first church uh, of, of the first sort of what, what we would call ecclesia, of mm-hmm. the body of believers that we see in any of the scriptures. Okay. Up until this point, we don't have churches. We have sort of a state religion hmm. in both Israel, but also in Nephite land. Okay. You know, people don't have a church. They have a, a, a state religion that everyone participates in because it's just what you do. Hmm. But this is a, what we would call in the United States a secular church, oh, okay. which means that you can join it or not join it. Hmm. You know, you you have your choice in whether or not you want to be part of this church. And there's another church in Messiah and in Alma, the Church of Nehor, that competes with it. Okay. So this idea that there are different churches and you can select which one you want to follow, mm-hmm. that is really born here. Okay. So I've noticed there is not a lot of art about these chapters in Mosiah. And I mean, to me, I think maybe they're just hard to illustrate because it's so hard to keep track of who and when we're talking about. Um, But so I think the artist has had to be a little bit creative here. What what do you see happening? Is there anything that um, where you see the artist taking some license here? Um, Yeah, the the fact that the city was burned. Yeah. That they're looking at this big burning fire of a city. That's not in the scriptures. That's not in yeah. the scriptures. Okay. 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 There's nothing in the text that says that the city of Nephi or the city of Shilom or whatever city they're looking at yeah. was destroyed by fire. Uh-huh. Um, it, it was just that it was dangerous. You need to get out. Right. Right. So, so he's 
sort of taking some creative license here to yes. show a, a group of people, families, uh, supporting each other on their way out, maybe standing on the hill looking back at the city. Yeah. It almost reminds me of kind of a, a Lot's wife sort of a scene of yeah. looking back to the destroyed city. Yeah, exactly. They're looking mm -hmm. back at what was destroyed mm -hmm. and they're feeling, uh, they're feeling the loss mm -hmm. of what, what they have lost. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, in the artist's mind, that's what's going to motivate some of them as soon as they get to Zarahemla to want to go back. Oh. These are very likely the people who decided that they were going to go back because mm -hmm. they were never really resolved to yeah. losing this. Interesting. Well, I like this piece because it does visualize a part of the scriptures that I haven't really spent a lot of time with, and it, it forced me to get in there and try yeah. to figure it out. And, and I think that's what mm -hmm. good religious art does, is it sends us back to the scriptures to engage with them in a deeper way. Do you have any uh, like personal reaction to this as, uh, in terms of the story or, or the art or the scriptures? So I think my, my first reaction when I saw this was mm -hmm. confusion because I yeah. couldn't figure out what it was representing. Right. It didn't seem to represent <laughs> anything in the text. And then it, it hit me that this is the artist filling in mm -hmm. gaps in the text mm -hmm. because there are a lot of gaps in the Book of Mormon. I mean, we think of the Book of Mormon as this thousand year story, yeah. but really it's three set pieces. The, Okay. Nephi and his family, then you have the Zarahemlins, and then you have the, the last days. It's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay. And there's, you know, half of the time that's covered in the Book of Mormon is not, is not part of the story. Right. You have to infer what yeah. might have happened. Uh -huh. And, you know, civilizations change a lot in three, four, five hundred years. Sure, yeah. And so we have to kind of go back and interpret mm -hmm. what we've missed mm -hmm. in as we've cut from one major type scene or one major set piece of the yeah. Book of Mormon to the next. Uh, and this, this does that. This, yeah. this tells us a story that is not in the text, but is inferable from the text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a very imaginative way to approach it. Yeah. I do like that Fulmer has included families, including women and children, which yeah. aren't mentioned at all in this story. Yeah. I don't think there's any mention of women no, and children at all. No, it makes a point to say yeah. that <laughs> these are 16 strong men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, but obviously there were going to be met women and children in this society too, so I like that, that yeah. Fulmer has included that. Um, well, thank you so much for helping me think this through today. I well, appreciate all you. your insights. I had a great time. Thanks. All right, thank you, Jenny.